much production. So today's session I will give insight about the politics of digital technology and uh, social media and how it has affected the democratic nature of knowledge or cultural production in the context of decreased direct human interaction. And audience, please do mute your audio and video. Okay. After the talk, we will have 15 minutes as question and answer session. Now I invite James Anand Krishnan to take over the session. Thank you. Uh, warm good morning to everybody. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Sir. Yeah. Uh, so I and we just like I mean sharing my uh, PowerPoint. Uh, just give me a second. Yeah, I, I hope it's visible. Is it visible? Okay, thank you. So, uh, the making of DJ Monopoly Democracy's Descent. See, while we talk about democracy and social media we obviously look at uh, in a very positive light uh, think about uh, social media's basic characteristic feature it's democratic we, we usually say that it's democratic because we have got enough space for our cultural expression expression of our personal ambitions our personal uh, voice of dissent which is very important as far as democracy is concerned uh, we uh, we can see a slice of the uh, heterogeneous character of the society in a social media space. But is it rather the truth? Uh, you know, when when uh, you know, if you, have, you saw the title, you even asked me like, why have I put it like this? Why have I put it uh, in uh, a negative shade? Making of Digi Monopoly democracy is descent. Democracy is descent. I mean, really. So, if we want to find an answer to that, we'll have to understand how, uh, you know, the uh, uh, society works uh, in relation with the individual. How uh, do we interact? How our selves are uh, formed uh, in the due course of our lifetimes? So, we'll uh, have to just take a sneak peek into uh, the theoretical dimensions of uh, how people have envisioned our social life uh, to be. Uh, before we get into social media, we'll have to understand how ourselves are formed with relation to the society and how that long process uh, still continues and uses divergent tools uh, for its development. If we have to understand that, you know, it all began pretty earlier. You know, when we think about social media, you, we, we usually speak about it is a millennial uh, phenomenon. Uh, some it started somewhere around two thousand six and moved on, but that's not really the case. Uh, on your screen, uh, can anybody identify what this is? Any guesses? Qwerty UIOP. Is the screen visible now? Is the screen visible? Any guesses? So, uh, you know, as you may all know, you might be staring at it right now uh, in your screens also, like uh, in even in your mobile. If you click your keypad, uh, you can see that that's a top line of your a keyboard. You know, why this line? Because this is where it all started. Uh, in 1971, a guy called Ray Tomlinson sent the first email. 
you know, he he's he's often referred to as the father of female. Then he was asked, well, "What was the first female that you sent?" He said uh, something random. It might be this particular line, Q W E R T Y U I O P. So this is where it all began. Then we had this grand media revolution, which changed our lives for the better. Well, better with a question mark. Now, if we have to understand. Uh, uh, you know, how it impacted our lives, we'll have to understand how media impacts our lives. Before we start, uh, you know, we'll have to travel a bit back, I mean, uh, to the beginning of the 20th century. That's exactly 120 years back. And at that point, we meet uh, this very interesting person called, we'll come back there, Charles Horton Cooley. Uh, Charles Horton Cooley is a very interesting sociologist and his book as you see on screen right now human nature human nature and social order human nature and social order is a very interesting uh, text which uh, you know which uh, proposed one of the four major theories of our character formation of the formation of our self See, looking class theory is very interesting. You can relate it very easily uh, to your own uh, lives. See, on the screen you see a very interesting slide. Uh, a guy looking at a, I mean, looking at four mirrors and seeing four of his selves. How his mom and dad sees it. How his girlfriend sees it. How his bro older brother sees me. Or uh, how, how how his ex girlfriend sees me. Applicable to women also. Like. Uh, you know your boyfriend how your boyfriend uh, sees you i mean it it, it you know it's it all the same uh, the thing is i see what he really wanted to tell uh, then and there is something very interesting when i say self look looking at the mirror uh, when i say the formation of self you might all related to a very specific person and that person we as we all know is sigmund freud well freud said uh, that our self uh, you know it, it's it, in its formative years, it's very much related to a, a deep psychological process. The way in which how we evolve, how, how we realize ourselves to be a very separate individual. It is all a long psychological process. Oh, which is well divided across your age. You know, from this month to this month. From this year to this year. It's, it's all done. A clear cut precision. But as far as uh, our good... Dear Charles Horton Cooley is concerned. He what he said is very interesting. See, it's not at all a psychological process; it's a sociological process. Now, how you equip uh, yourself with the, uh, you know, uh, you know the the tool of uh, social interaction, uh, how you uh, create yourself, it's all dependent upon your uh, interaction with the public. Now, how does that happen? See, he says that this happens in uh, three different steps. So this is very important. When I, uh, you know, when I refer to these three steps, think about our usage in social media. Because only after these considerations can we uh, analyze what happens out there in the world of digital monopoly. You know, what he says is that first we create a picture of ourselves. You know, uh, how we think, how we behave, uh, uh, you know, how we think... Uh, about ourselves uh, uh, being placed in the society. For instance, when you uh, look at the mirror, you might see one of the most successful uh, people around. And uh, you feel that that is a right picture. Um, you know, that's a right way, that's a, that's a true way you are in. Uh, and, and we superimpose this image on ourselves. And that's a second step. And then we, uh, you know, th th then this is the pseudo personality that we always keep and that might not, not be the uh, right way we are in but this is a pseudo personality that we keep and this happens and uh, this also influences a lot in our social behavior and even uh, Cooley says in this particular book human nature and social order uh, you know uh, that how do we behave in a situation where we are in the public you know what he says is that number one we think about the situation. Second, we think about how others will behave in the situation. And then we think about uh, what reaction uh, would they, uh, you know, uh, uh, produce in that situation, the public. Then we 
enact the reaction. So this is the steps in which we, uh, you know, create our uh, behavioral patterns. But this is largely applicable to the uh, social media, uh, uh, you know, you know, the the uh, social media behaviors as well. You know, we all have this uh, Facebook profile which we uh, create. You know, I'm not generalizing. I mean, like it's a generalized statement. People may be different. But largely, we create a, 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 a portray a self, which is in, which is way different from how, how I mean who we are in our uh, daily lives. The the way in which uh, give me a second. Okay. See, somebody is pressing a screen. Hope hope uh, my screen is visible. Uh, so, think about it. It's not visible. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, think about uh, you know your your uh, Facebook profiles. Let's let's uh, let's think about our Facebook profiles uh, and. Uh, you know, most of it is a representation of the pseudo uh, personality that we create. And uh, why does that happen is also a big question. See, why do we create such a pseudo personality? Uh, see, is my uh, uh, slide visible now? Yeah, it's visible. Okay, fine. Uh, so, uh, in when we create this, we want to realize with the uh, largest society out there. You know, we have this picture deep down that, uh, come on, uh, people are going to believe me uh, only uh, if I do this and that and that. So, you, you, know, you have this general tendency to project yourself uh, as one among them, uh, a realization with the largest society. And when that happens, you go by this model that... A good old coolie has developed the looking glass self. Now, after uh, you know the release of this interesting book, ten years later, you might all be familiar with this particular name, and this man, this very interesting man. I mean, uh, what a very interesting book. Now, uh, I don't know how many of you can uh, identify him from this picture. He has made it into time magazine so you might all uh, you know say come on he's important well, well he's very important this person is Walter Lippmann Walter Lippmann uh, released in 1922 a very interesting book and this is uh, uh, you know this is heavily criticized upon but inevitably a milestone as far as sociological studies uh, are concerned this book is titled public opinion see uh, in the public opinion, he was expanding on what our dearest Charles Horton Cooley has commended. See, this book, uh, you know, proposed an idea that there is always a pseudo environment that surrounds uh, an individual. Uh, you know, a pseudo environment that we create, uh, a pseudo environment upon which we, uh, you know, uh, enact uh, social roles, a pseudo environment on which we, um, you know, we, we uh, showcase our personalities. See, this pseudo environment is a social construction. So you, you learn a lot about this, you know, after a few uh, decades pass and we uh, come to this study of social construction. Uh, or social constructionism, uh, where uh, you know uh, people always I mean uh, we you might all have uh, read about it and understood that our reality is really a constructed one. Uh, well, why was public opinion so controversial? And this is where we get into the second phase of our session. See, we were talking about our personality, how we interact with the public, and the last theory where we uh, studied Cooley. Now we are connecting it with democracy see how is democracy so important as far as our social behavior is concerned so the question is how is it not uh, see if our behaviors are all like there is less dissent see i quote this from lipman 
if our behaviors are all alike, we think alike, we act alike, democracy will be an easier task. See, this is why he was criticized then. See, we celebrate democracy as a institution which celebrates dissent. But Lippmann was of the idea that dissent should be, I am quoting him again and again, dissent should be normalized using the machinery of propaganda. And he used propaganda in a good light. See, propaganda should be used to suppress all dissents and create a very smooth functioning of democratic societies. And this is what he said. Think about it. And, 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 and he suggested one more thing. How should this be done? By using mass communication. See, by then, technological advancement, advancement has not been, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, has not been developed into that extent. But he still said, for a creation of a, a virtual reality, virtual reality in the sense, you create a reality which is entirely different from what is happening around. And to create consent among the public. So consent, the word comes here to a common consent to be requested upon the masses, the individuals, the citizens to function a democracy, you should use propaganda. So <coughs> this is a time at which Lippmann comes in with his ideas. See, in this particular text, there is this interesting phrase called manufacturing consent. It rings a bell. It should ring a bell because this is the book from which the next step begins. Two interesting people, the first of whom is on your screen, I, I, I hope. Uh, and this person is Noam Chomsky. Noam Chomsky and his good friend Edward S. Herman. This is Edward S. Herman. They both, both uh, authored a book in 1988 titled Manufacturing Consent, the Political Economy of the Mass Media. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, Edward S. I mean, when you look at the book, it's uh, given Edward S. Herman and Noam Chomsky. Uh, there is an interesting story. Uh, when Noam Chomsky was asked, see, you are quite well known. Why do you put your name, uh, you know, uh, as a first author? Uh, what is the problem? Uh, then Chomsky, you know, he was, uh, he was uh, bloody honest. Uh, you know, as far as the academic community is concerned, uh, uh, we usually don't like to put our names second to anybody. Uh, uh, first is obviously the pride matters. Second is it APA matters. Uh, so usually you uh, do that a bit much. Uh, you overdo it a bit much. Well, uh, Chomsky was very happy because, you know, Chomsky made up I mean, when he was asked, why do you do this? Then he said, 60% of the paper belongs to Edward Herman. See, uh, for as far as I am concerned, uh, my contribution is pretty diminished. Think about it. He was, he was, a, he was a rising star at the particular point of time. Then uh, getting back to the book, you know, uh, he was heavily criticizing upon what uh, you know, Lippmann had scribbled down. See, Lippmann was of the idea that you should use propaganda machinery. Chomsky commented that this is the curse of democracy. See, the propaganda machinery and, uh, you know, silencing uh, the voices of dissent. Then he said, if these system supportive propaganda is what silences the will of the people, and you should always be in vigil to analyze this exploitative, uh, you know, uh, submissive nature of democracy by employing the tool of mass media. See, and he created a model. This propaganda model is very important when you study media or new media or any forms of media uh, taken for granted. See, every propaganda machinery has got these uh, five interesting filters. 
the first one is financial ownership but think about it uh, if you run a media company uh, uh, if you run a media company then one thing is very important money the capital that is uh, employed to <laughs> run a company you'll have to pay your workers you'll have to run your company your technological aspects you will have to do I mean like make profit with your company at least you should run it without loss see when finance comes first financial interest also come in you know the the the, the way in which you can uh, you know um, hunt profit down uh, when you hunt profit down a truth is also killed uh, you know usually that happens a lot uh, second thing is advertising so you'll have to go with uh, a pr work for many companies it can be companies and as, as seen in the recent past uh, you know not to uh, refer to any political party or or a, or a you know political figure advertising see advertising is not just for the corporate companies it can also be for political ideologies political parties uh, and and election campaigns even uh, second thing is, I mean, third thing is reliance on PR. See how much you are reliant upon PR for the development of the company itself. So it's not about the advertising that you host in your company, but all about the way in which you are being celebrated. It can be of, it can, it can be a celebration to peer groups. This channel is good, that is good, and that that particular media is giving more freedom. And this is unhyphenated journalism. That's not. This is right leaning. Then it also includes. Uh, you know, uh, shaming, um, uh, saying that the other media is, uh, I mean, a particular party channel or that media, this media is a, uh, you know, corporate driven uh, uh, scandal monger. You you can, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know, uh, create your own names, paparazzi. You know that shaming happens every then and now. Third thing is flak. So what is flak? Uh, flak is very interesting. Flak is a negative response that you uh, get. See, why is negative response so important? Negative response is very much important because you can always ex expect, uh, you know, uh, negative comments on your channel uh, from public interest litigations, uh, you know, from um, you know, public negation of the ideas, the news that you provide. And this will have a very negative response upon the a negative uh, impact upon the first factor that we are talking about. If your channel is attacked too much upon, your financial, uh, you know, base might be uh, kind of ruptured. The funding through advertising may come down. So it's very important that you keep them at bay. And the fifth one is anti-communism and fear. When you see that you obviously anti-communism and fear, what is it? See, uh, while Noam Chomsky uh, wrote this particular model, uh, it was at the uh, you know uh, height of the cold war you know the 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 cold war between us and ussr was going on very strongly after 1988 he replaced this particular phrase with war on terror so this is all about the theoretical part that i want to talk about see these are the things when you will have to keep into consideration while we look at uh, media or social media or new media so uh, we'll explain all this on the way. See how we relate it on. Uh, before that, do you think that uh, it, it, just for a uh, interlude, let me ask you: uh, Do you really think uh, that these propaganda machinery all began after the development of? Uh, you know, you might all be asking: Why are you referring to these theories from 1900s? Why do explain a modern uh, phenomenon? Uh, you know, of social media and uh, media behaviors. Do you think it all started then? Uh, let me uh, introduce you uh, uh, to another person. Really understand this has always been happening. See, it's the same uh, old, uh, uh, you know, uh, papyrus scroll that that the Egyptian used earlier on. Uh, that you know now that is now manifested as your uh, uh, computer screens. Or, or the mobile or tablet screens that you're watching right now. So it's basically the same thing. Uh, you know, the only thing is that it is it has traveled all the way through many years so that the tool has developed, uh, you know, way too much. Uh, so it 
no as far as propaganda machinery is concerned this is also what has been happening all these years see uh, for example when i say uh, when i say torches of freedom you might uh, imagine a picture of something like this torches of freedom you know people out there agitating for freedom uh, people out there bearing torches and coming out to the streets and uh, doing their rallies for freedom but torches of freedom is i think it's it's the one of the earliest uh, propaganda machinery successes torches of freedom actually refers to this and this is the i, I think this is a first most successful commercial propaganda machinery what is torches of freedom uh, it will be very interesting see there is this interesting man uh you have him on the screen right now this man is edward bernays edward bernays is a uh, is considered to be the father of public relations and the uh, the picture that you saw on the screen uh you know earlier this one is the first commercial success as far as bernays is concerned it was in uh, 1947 uh, that he wrote a book called engineering consent See, engineering concern reveals all this. How this propaganda machinery works. See, Torches of Freedom was actually a advertising campaign. Uh, uh, you know, uh, designed by Bernays for the American Tobacco Company. The it's a company's name, American Tobacco Company. He was uh, then working for another tobacco company called Ligets and Mayers. Then uh, you know he he was bought. Uh, when within a double inverted comma, he was bought by uh american tobacco company for the promotion of smoking among women you know you know what did he do uh he used feminism to sell cigarettes mm -hmm. uh that's a very interesting part uh, see uh if you want to understand it more clearly i'll give you this picture uh you know what he did then was it uh, be empowered you can smoke a cigarette like a man so for commercial interest you used a uh, you know used an ideology which is uh, which which was actually envisioned to uplift women uh, empower women uh, you used that to sell cigarettes uh, see uh, associating an ideology with a commodity and it, and this is the most i think this is the first most successful use of ideology for commercial exploitation see ideology and uh, corporate uh, you know as we you know, usually we think about it like like this we we envision it like this we create a to go by the uh, good old lipman model we i would say we all have the pseudo environment developed around us saying that corporate companies have nothing to do with ideology it has got everything to do with ideologies they sell ideologies in a different packing now we we'll, Uh, cut back to our topic right now so this is where we get in you i think you are all familiar with this particular person marshall mcluhan and his interesting book medium is a massage uh medium is a massage is a very interesting thing see uh, everything becomes a uh, uh, you know uh, for interesting when you think about a medium uh, how much does a medium affect uh you know the the result of a message being transmitted see an easy interesting analogy to be i mean this is actually an analogy from mcluhan himself when you send a message across a platform uh, in a, 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 a medium uh the medium dictates how the machine reaches the other end the analogy that he uses is that of an electric line See, the current transmitted through an electric line is as good as the quality of the wire used in the electric line the metal used in that electric line if it's pretty bad the the, the end result will be as as pretty bad uh, as the medium so the medium dictates how a machine is uh, you know uh, propagated think about it uh, uh, in the uh, you know uh, in the environment of the social media see what if 
your social media is controlling you what if the social media messages are filtered down what if social media is highly highly censored and this is the point in which our discourse starts see uh, uh, don't think that social media is something that started all the way uh, you know in 2000 this is not a millennial baby this there, there was this gradual uh, sorry this there was this gradual evolution that started started all the way back in the uh, 18th century see social media basically you can define social media as, uh, as a media which is related to the society simple but in our modern context we uh, use the idea in a very different uh, uh, you know uh, with a with a very different purpose we usually refer it to as social networking services or sns Uh, to define it, social networking services are those which employs Web 2.0 platforms or websites, which creates user-generated content. Now, before all that began, before all those all those SNS platforms began in 1792, we had this uh, incredible idea of telegraph. 1865, William Murdoch came up with pneumatic post. In 1900s, telephone, then the radio. see uh, think about it all, all in all this gradual evolutions uh, the media you know it, it, it's not that's why i was telling you the media was trying to reach out to the masses so in in uh, years to come it gradually evolved uh, you know telegraph if you if you think about telegraph you could barely send a few lines when it comes to telephone you can speak to the person directly so interaction is uh, even more greater a radio you could access what is happening around you know you could you could all gather around a small box and understand what is happening around the world and it doesn't stop there and when you think about social media the web platforms you might think about see i think it's facebook uh, that started the social media revolution uh, see uh, on your screen is a very interesting in 1960s we have this very interesting uh, uh you know a uh, a uh, 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 proto uh, social media uh, you know version called compuserve uh, this is 1960s my friends uh, so this is this is a proto model see attempts were always there uh, the only fact is that mr zuckerberg was the first person to be uh, you know very successful at it uh, and six degrees this is a first social networking site in 1997 this is a first social networking uh, site if you if you can see the screen very clearly you can see that logo you would be surprised who you know check out our newer service recommendations see friend recommendations is now a, uh, you know a, a task which is come well, on well, that's normal uh, you know that that was not normal in 1997 in 6 degrees it was the first time that uh, you know friend recommendations were uh, seen uh, uh, and and even uh, there were uh, can you see that screen 6 degrees 6 degrees you can see yes, that right? yeah yeah fine fine okay so uh, think about it uh, see then uh, if you if you can see it more clearly down there it's also written one of one of the uh, interesting phenomenon that we even now see in social networking say do you have multiple 6 degree accounts merge them so, uh, you know people now even now have Uh, multiple uh, accounts in their facebooks uh, instas uh, see this is uh, this is uh, the point at which uh, it was feeling the vibe of the millennium but i um, mean my space was a uh, linkedin was uh, I mean developed pretty earlier but in 2005 and 2006 youtube brought about a grand revolution Ch- i mean chat hurley steven channon javed karim see eventually it was also bought up uh, but the revolution came out with this very interesting phenomenon the facebook the basically this was developed as we all know for the popular consumption at harvard university so uh, this was basically very much limited to harvard university at first the story of digital monopoly is also the story of facebook how it emerged from uh you know from a social networking platform like any other from like orkut 
I, I do strongly believe that most of you had Orkut accounts earlier on. It was just like Orkut. It was just like six degrees. It was just like computer. How Facebook now governs the entire social media world. How it has created a virtual monopoly. The digi monopoly of the social media world. The SNS is Facebook. Facebook, the SNS king. I, I would even say emperor. It is devouring each and every single uh, you know, an, an, an social networking platform. So what is the problem? They have money. They can buy anything. They can move on. Think about it. See, I'll give you an example. What is the problem with Facebook creating a monopoly over... Um, I mean, I hope you all know that most of the social networking sites that we currently use, ex ex except a few, are, uh, you know, governed by Facebook Incorporated, the company. Our Instas, our Whatsapps, our Facebooks. See, think about it. They do own them all. They do own us all, uh, if I put it that way. See, what is the problem? Uh, think about um, this condition. Let's uh, be analog as again. Uh, think about this condition where you live in a village. Okay? A village where there are five shops with different products where it's whether it's a town or a village doesn't matter there you've got these five shops which are selling many items fine then you've got choice you can go uh, you know leave one shop go to the next one buy something get uh, get them back to your home what if there is a single shop a single shop in your village or your town you'll be forced to go to that particular shop buy your commodities come back home Keep it there and keep shut. This is what happens in social media monopoly. See, if one company owns everything, you'll be forced to consume the product the company delivers. You are left of choices. See, this is where things get... This is where it all starts. This is just a beginning. But what does, what does that mean for, our, mean for all of us? And why is Facebook devouring everything on its way you know it all began after 2009 2009 was a very interesting year because 2009 is the year when which this particular section this particular enterprise of facebook began facebook business see facebook business started off with uh, with its ads, its uh, you know ads that you can pay, ad suggestions that you that pops up every now and then in your uh, you know Facebook account. But see, if you are interested in knowing Facebook uh, ads, the first thing I'd say is that you really go and have a hands-on experience. You start a page. If you have a page, you might all have seen this particular uh, pop-up coming up, saying that come on, make uh, get more views uh, by uh, opting uh, premium options where you can opt for five dollars from from five dollars a day you've got many options like even i think five dollars a month is also available it I mean uh, limiting or extending the number of views of your page across the facebook community see more you pay more people have visibility you can uh, you, you can reach to more and more people uh, even more and more likes uh, more and more subscriptions. You see, everything, every single uh, thing on this platform is put for sale. But you would think, see, that's business. The people, uh, you know, usually sell things. That's why they are, they are making it, you know, social media. See, I also go by this uh, lines. I mean, no, no, I also support your argument while you say that. We create our corporate enterprises for profit. Profit is not bad. And I don't even say that my, my, my profit is anybody else's loss. Uh, but let's now come to the real picture. Uh, what is the problem there? What is the problem of this digital uh, monopoly? Have, can you see that screen on the screen there? Can you see that screen there? 
Yeah. That screen. Uh, on the blue name, the, the, the countries marked in blue represent those countries where Facebook is the most leading social media platform. That blue. Trust me, that's a uh, that's the extent of uh, you know eighty two percent of the what the the globe uses FB. If this is the extent to which it has got its uh, arms, uh, maybe a few Middle East countries. Then China is obviously China has everything banned, uh, not just Facebook, almost everything, including a good dear Google. Uh, See, uh, this is the extent to which Facebook has, uh, you know, grappled its hooks. So when I say grapple its hooks in a negative light, you know, you, if you want uh, an evidence, when uh, if you want to know why, I would suggest you this interesting person called Timur Kuran. Timur Kuran is one of uh, the leading. Uh, I hope it uh, slide is okay. Okay, fine. Uh, uh, Timur Kuran is a very interesting uh, figure if you are interested in social media. And this particular text is also very important. Private truths, public links, the social consequences of preference falsification. See, this particular word is something that you'll have to keep in mind while you uh, understand and analyze, study, discuss uh, social media. Preference falsification. See, I told you about our... Uh, pages put on for sale. What if our ideas are put on for sale? What if our ideas are filtered down? This happens in social media as well. You know, you, we usually take it for granted that social media platforms provide incredible opportunities for our, uh, you know, you know, our free preferences, our free will to work, uh, you know, uh, without bounds, without limits, without contours being drawn around it. But Timur Kuran has another opinion. He what he says is that our preferences in social media, the likes that we put in there, the shares that we put, I mean, uh, do there, everything is filtered down by this interesting method called preference falsification. Our preferences are falsified. How? Preference falsification is a method in which you are constantly provided inputs on how people around you think. For instance, when you see a post concerning a particular subject repeating again and again in your Facebook, even though you have an opinion which is contrary to what you think that the people believe, you will go by the people's thoughts. Uh, for for uh, and This happens a lot. Uh, this happens a lot. Uh, give me a second. Uh, am I audible? Uh, yes, sir. You are audible. Our time is limited. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up soon. I'll wrap it up soon. Fine. Okay. So, as far as uh, this preference falsification is concerned, see, our... Uh, the, the way in which we uh, carve out our opinions are all dependent upon, uh, you know, uh, the inputs that we receive in Facebook itself. See, and by this, we, you know, develop a, a falsified uh, view of the world. That if, uh, you know, why does that happen? Because we have something called social. I'll just wrap it up in five minutes, okay? Uh, Social responsibility bias. See, social responsibility bias is very interesting. You know, we usually have this habit of going by what we think the society believes to be true. So, if we are given, you know, uh, inputs of ideas, uh, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, that, that makes us believe, uh, that takes us to this false belief that, uh, you know, most of the people are going by a concept which is contrary to your own. You will always be forced to go by it. This is called social responsibility bias. So you think that it is your responsibility to go by what the society thinks. You know, your mind obviously tells you that you are not to be a rebel. 
this is why we discussed in the beginning about these theories from the early 1900s. It all was revealed in a very interesting, uh, you know, um, news that we all received somewhere in 2014. During the Trump campaign, uh, you know, there was this interesting uh, scandal called Cambridge Analytica Facebook scandal where uh, we understood that political opinions, the uh, the the uh, the takes of people on uh, political parties were put on sale via Cambridge Analytica uh, and Facebook, uh, where the data was there for sale. And even Indian election, uh, uh, you know, management firms, we, we know, you know, election management firms, including the great Mr. Prashant Kishore, uh, runs the election business out there. So Cambridge Analytica Facebook scandal exposed it all. Uh, you know, th in Facebook, you are, your details are put there up for sale. Now, as far as when they say Facebook, uh, you know, this and that are happening. See, do you have an insider who is telling you this? I have an insider who is telling uh, you this. You have this uh, person called Ellie Pariser, uh, who uh, wrote this interesting book called Zucked. Z U Z K E D. You know who he is referring to. Sucked. Uh, uh, and uh, in that particular book, he was talking about uh, a, uh, I mean uh, filter bubbles. See how we are all part of filter bubbles in Facebook. Uh, what he says is that we are all parts of algorithms where we, our thoughts are limited by bubbles which filter our thoughts and thought processes where we are selectively exposed. To a few ideas and thereby molding our concept there is obviously a big brother planning our next move so and this creates something that we call cultural hedge money uh, I hope that screen was visible now to uh, you know uh, the time is running short so I have to somehow conclude uh, but See, think about it. When we are, uh, when one company is at the top, governing all our thoughts, that's a one easy ticket to buy to govern our thoughts. It's 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 a one easy ticket for the government to govern our thoughts. It is one easy ticket for the political parties to govern our thoughts. It is one easy ticket for certain ideologies to govern our thought. Everything, even our minds, are put on sale. We have a sale tag attached to every individual's mind, every individual's brain out there. So my dear, dearest friends, think about it. There is a big media giant out there. See, Rupert Murdoch is an old tale. Uh, the new world is governed by, you know, people who govern our minds govern us. Uh, and social media to a large extent has become a part of our lives. And that too in this period of COVID where we are separated, uh, we uh, we have less, I mean, the least access to the world around. Uh, you know, we are sitting at our homes, we are looking at the world through this simple glass door in our phones. And this is what is happening. And this monopoly of Facebook will be a great threat if not seriously uh, you know ob observed by the, uh, the, the the academic communities who think that uh, the social media is a door to revolutionary self-expressive uh, you know uh, world of freedom well I would uh, uh, go by uh, the the you know good old Lipman's word this is a pseudo environment my friends this is where we lose everything. This is where we lose our minds. So one company taking it all over doesn't seem very good for the good will of our thoughts. So uh, I know we are short on time. Otherwise, I would have uh, extended this a bit more. So uh, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, uh, thank you for spending 45 minutes of your valuable time with me. And uh, thank you so much.